Assalamualaikum. Today, the topic that we're going to discuss is pentose phosphate pathway, also known as the hexose monophosphate pathway or the HMP shunt, right? This pentose phosphate pathway is basically a pathway about a 5 carbon compound. It is a journey or a story of a 5 carbon compound with a phosphate attached. It, uh, it occurs in cytosol and it is a very important pathway to provide us with intermediates of glycolysis, NADPH, as well as uh, ribodose 5-phosphate which is used in the synthesis of DNA and RNA or nucleotide synthesis generally. So how does it all happen? Let's see. This pentose phosphate pathway consists of two phases. There is an oxidative or an irreversible or an irreversible phase and a non-oxidative which is a reversible phase, right? So what happens is that uh, we have a glucose 6-phosphate molecule which, uh, which was formed from glucose by the hexokinase enzyme and that glucose 6-phosphate was also being used in the process of glycolysis to ultimately yield pyruvate and ATP as well in the process but some of it was also being used to produce another compound called 6-phosphoglucuronolactone which is uh, from where the pentose phosph phosphate pathway starts, right? So this glucose 6-phosphate is shunted into this pathway, hence known as a hexose monophosphate shunt. This glucose is a hexose, so hexose monophosphate shunt, it has a phosphate in it, right? So it is shunted in this direction. Now, this is an oxidative phase where there is redox reaction occurring, right? Where there is a loss of hydrogens, gain of hydrogens, so only uh, that occurs in this oxidative phase and not in the non-oxidative or the reversible phase. It is, this is an irreversible phase. No going back, right? So an enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase catalyzes this reaction to form glucose 6-phosphate to 6-phosphoglucuronolactone and because there is a dehydrogenase it yields an NADPH molecule. Now you might be surprised that why is there no NADH? <clears throat> so in a separate video on the uses of NADPH I will be highlighting those questions, the answer to this question that uh, why is NADPH produced, right? So just remember for, for the timing that an NADPH molecule is produced. Now this 6-phosphoglucuronolactone will be acted upon by another enzyme which is 6-phosphoglucuronolactone hydrolase, right? Hydrolase. And will form 6-phosphogluconate. Now this 6-phosphogluconate will be acted upon by another enzyme 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase another dehydrogenase which means another NADPH molecule and in this uh, reaction uh, there is a carbon dioxide molecule produced as well so that this 6 carbon compound is reduced to a 5 carbon compound ribulose 5-phosphate, it is a 5 carbon compound right? so carbon dioxide uh, is released in this process and in this whole process we get two NADPH molecules a ribulose 5-phosphate intermediate which will enter a non-oxidative phase and this non-oxidative phase I will explain uh, with the help of a diagram in the uh, Lippincourt Medical Biochemistry book I'm using the 7th edition so uh, I'm going to explain it on that diagram let's see what happens alright so I did not draw all of this onto the whiteboard because it, it would get really tiresome to draw all of this and uh, because most of us we use Lippincourt as a primary book for studying medical biochemistry so uh, this diagram is pretty confusing so I thought it's best to eliminate this confusion right away uh, so let's begin alright so now we've made this ri ribulose 5-phosphate from 6-phosphogluconate now this ribulose 5-phosphate has two fates it can either form ribose 5-phosphate which will be directly used in the synthesis of nucleotides DNA and RNA uh, via the enzyme ribose 5-phosphate isomerase because both of these are isomers right when, when you have ulose U -L -O -S -E, it, it, it means that the, that the compound is a ketose sugar when you have OSE it means it is an aldose sugar and if you forgot what ketose and aldoses are so this carbon, when, when uh, the non-terminal carbon or the carbon in between 
the two carbon and the two terminal carbons, any carbon in between, is a du is doubly bonded to an oxygen atom. It forms a ketone, right? It is a ketose sugar. However, if a terminal carbon is bonded doubly to an oxygen atom and singly to a hydrogen atom, it forms an aldehyde or an aldose sugar. So this is an aldose sugar. This is a keto sugar. Both of these are isomers. So we're using an isomerase enzyme, right? And this ribose 5-phosphate is going to be used directly in nucleotide synthesis. Now coming to ribose 5-phosphate back again, the other fate is to convert it into another compound, which is xylulose 5-phosphate. Now both of these compounds have eulose in them, hence both, both of these are ketoses, but they're still isomers. Why? Alright, if you notice both of these compounds and especially their carbon atoms and the spatial arrangements around each of these carbon atoms, you'll notice that the uh, atoms on the carbon atoms are exactly on the same side for the corresponding atoms on both the compounds except for one carbon atom. Now if you look, OH is onto the right side of the first carbon in ribose 5-phosphate as well as in the xylulose 5-phosphate, right? And the same is the case for all the other carbons. However, there is one carbon, which is carbon number 3, which has the OH onto the right side in the ribulose 5-phosphate mo molecule, while it has the OH onto the left side in the th on third carbon in the xylulose 5-phosphate molecules. This is also isomerization, but more specifically it is known as epimerization, and both these compounds are epimers of one another, and in this case, carbon number 3 epimers, right? So the enzyme required to convert ribulose 5-phosphate to xylulose 5-phosphate is phos phosphopentose epimerase, right? Phosphopentose epimerase. Alright, now this xylulose 5-phosphate is going to yield intermediates of glyco glycolysis, right? And we'll learn how. Before we move on, I want, you to, I want to introduce you to two enzymes. Number one is this transketolase. Transketolase is transfer, transfer two carbon atoms from a compound, from one compound onto another, right? Two carbon compounds. The other class is a transallulase, which, which does the same job, but with three carbon atoms. It transfers three carbon atoms from one compound to another, right? So what happens is that once ribulose 5-phosphate forms xylulose 5-phosphate, this transketolase acts onto this xylulose 5-phosphate and removes two of these carbon atoms, the ones highlighted, two of these carbon atoms, and adds them to a ribose 5-phosphate molecule, converting this ribose 5-phosphate molecule, which is a 5-carbon compound, into a 7-carbon compound, which is pseudoheptulose 7-phosphate. And when we remove two carbons from this compound, xylulose 5-phosphate, we are left with a 3-carbon compound. And that 3-carbon compound is now glyceraldehyde, 3-phosphate, which if you remember is a very important intermediate in glycolysis and it will be important to produce ATP via glycolysis. So it goes into the glycolytic pathway, right? Now, this pseudoheptulose 7-phosphate is then acted upon by, uh, by a transaldolase enzyme and that transaldolase enzyme now removes 3 carbon atoms, right? So three carbon atoms are removed from pseudoheptulose 7-phosphate. These three carbon atoms, they are transferred to the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule, converting this three carbon compound into a six carbon compound, fructose 6-phosphate. This fructose 6-phosphate is also an intermediate of glycolysis, right? So it can also enter into glycolysis. If it does not enter into glycolysis, glycolysis however, it can form xylulose 5-phosphate again via a transketolase enzyme which will remove two of its carbon atoms and give it to a free glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule to form xylulose 5-phosphate regenerating this compound back so the cycle continues and itself be converted into another 4-carbon compound which is erythrose 4-phosphate. Earlier, earlier as well this 7-carbon compound used, uh, was converted into uh, erythrose 4 phosphate as well when it lost 3 carbon atoms to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, right? Alright, so now why is this important? It's important because in conditions, for example, during uh, heavy exercise, 
when there is also anaerobic respiration going on uh, and glycolysis is the only means of ATP production we require more of these intermediates to be used for glyco gly glycolysis to produce more and more ATP which is what we need at that time, right? So once we made gly glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate from xylulose 5-phosphate in the first step this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate will immediately go into glycolysis to uh, yield ATP ultimately so fructose 6-phosphate will not be made, right? However, once fructose 6-phosphate is made, as is the case when ATP, when ATP is present in adequate amounts, right? So this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is then converted to fructose 6-phosphate. And now fructose 6-phosphate, if you remember, uh, is be also being, whilst being an intermediate in, of glycolysis, it can convert to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate uh, in the glycolytic uh, pathway via an enzyme called phosphofructokinase 1. However, that phosphofructokinase 1 uh, is subject to product inhibition and one of those products is ATP. So if ATP is present in adequate amounts, fructose 6-phosphate will not be converted to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and glycolysis will stop, right? It will cease to occur further. So then this fructose 6-phosphate will become xylulose 5-phosphate as I just explained via transketolase enzyme so that more of this is made and then this ribulose 5-phosphate is not converted into xylulose 5-phosphate which we already have in ample amounts so it is shunted and, and then is converted to ribose 5-phosphate for DNA synthesis which is continuously occurring as well, right? So unfortunately however in people who suffer from cancers uh, because there is uh, an increase in nucleotide and DNA synthesis and cell division so more and more ribose 5-phosphate is being formed, right? as opposed to the intermediates of glycolysis via xylulose 5-phosphate so more and more energy is being used uh, to produce DNA which is why uh, people who have cancer have uh, symptoms such as, such as fatigue, right? they're easily fatigued why? Because this glucose 6-phosphate molecule is a high energy molecule because we invested an ATP molecule into glucose to form a glucose 6-phosphate and it does, that glucose 6-phosphate is being used only to convert to uh, this ribose 5-phosphate to form DNA then what happens is that more and more energy is being produced for DNA synthesis and we're not left for gly glycolytic uh, intermediates uh, to be formed, right? So it can lead to uh, easy fatigability. Uh, so consider this reaction because it is a very long pathway, right? These are not, not this is not a normal glyco glycolysis reaction because in glycolysis this glucose 6-phosphate could be directly converted into fructose 6-phosphate via the, the phosphoglucose isomerase enzyme. So we do not need all of these intermediates. So consider this pho pentose phosphate pathway as a, uh, as a backup or as a, uh, you know, reserve for uh, ATP, right, for gly glycolytic intermediates, and uh, that's uh, that's it. Uh, I hope you understood. One thing I forgot to mention is the role of cedo uh, cedohydrolose seven phosphate and erythrose four phosphate. Uh, they don't have a role as such in the process of glycolysis, and neither do they have a role in the process of glycolysis, nor do they have a role in the process of nucleotide synthesis, right? They're just there as, as intermediates of the pentose phosphate pathway for the exchange of carbon atoms across the intermediates so that they can favor the conversion of uh, compounds to glycolytic intermediates and, of, and, to and to intermediates of the nucleotide synthesis, right? As such, they don't have any other role but just to for the exchange of carbon atoms to favor the synthesis of glycolytic intermediates or the, this intermediate ribose 5-phosphate. That's it.